How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? I'm your host, Truman Bradley. It's difficult to believe that while I'm sitting at this desk, this room is moving at the amazing speed of 66,000 miles an hour. The Earth is not moving, and we can prove this day in and day out. That's the constant speed of the Earth as it moves around the sun. The Earth is not moving, and we can prove this day in and day out. Yes, even while standing still, we're moving from place to place. Yes, even while standing still, we're moving from place to place. The Earth is not moving, and we can prove this day in and day out. In 1913, Sanyak carried out a simple experiment of passing light in opposite directions around a table and recombining them. And they go around the circuit and are recombined at the splitter and recombining prism so that they again produce the fringes on the photographic plate. Now let us rotate the table. Before we do so, there is the very important subject of the effect of the ether. The Michelson-Morley experiment failed to detect the 30 kilometers per second motion of the Earth through the ether. So to overcome this problem, Einstein simply abolished the ether. Einstein simply abolished the ether. The very significant result of the Sanyak experiment was that it proved that the ether existed. It proved that the ether existed. If a telescope is pointing at a star and both are stationary, then obviously the light comes straight into the telescope. In 1729, Bradley found that he had to tip his telescope forward very slightly to get a star in the center of his telescope. It was assumed that this was due to the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Let us assume that the telescope was moving at 5 mile an hour and had to be tipped 5 degrees. This 5 degree tipping, however, could equally be caused by the ether moving at 5 mile an hour carrying the stars around the Earth. As we see here, the light would be coming in at the same angle and the telescope would still have to be tipped 5 degrees. So tipping the telescope does not tell us whether it is the starlight moving or the telescope moving. However, there is a simple experiment that can determine whether it was the Earth that was moving or the ether and starlight. All that you had to do was record the tipping required for any particular star, then fill the telescope with water, which greatly slows down the speed of light in the telescope. So here is the moving telescope filled with water, tipped at five degrees, and you can see that the starlight does not now reach the eyepiece at the bottom. This is because the starlight moves much more slowly when passing through water. However, if the telescope is tipped further, say 10 degrees, then the starlight will then be visible again in the eyepiece. It has to be tipped further because the light is now slower when in the telescope. But if the starlight is going past the telescope at 5 mile an hour, then when it is filled with water, no t further tipping is needed because the light is coming in at 5 degrees anyway. The starlight stays on the same path but is only travelling slower in the water. To recap, 
If it is the telescope that is moving, then when it is filled with water, it has to be tipped further to see the star. If the telescope is stationary and the starlight drifting past us, then it does not have to be tipped further. In 1871, George Biddle Airy, the Astronomer Royal, performed this experiment. This is a copy from his original report. You can see that the two readings are virtually identical. In 1913, Sanyak carried out a simple experiment of passing light in opposite directions around a table and recombining them. This produced interference fringes. He then rotated the whole table at two revolutions per second and found that the fringes changed. This result has very significant implications in science. It proved that the ether existed. It works as follows. A beam of light leaves the light source at the bottom left hand corner and is split into two different beams which we have coloured red and blue just to distinguish them. They travel round the circuit in opposite directions until they eventually reach the splitter which also recombines them. There they then go on to the photographic plate where they have interference fringes. In this simplified version we see the beam is split into two, the red and the blue again, and they go round the circuit and are recombined at the splitter and recombining prism so that they again produce the fringes on the photographic plate. Now let us rotate the table. Before we do so, there is the very important subject of the effect of the ether. The michelson morley experiment failed to detect the 30 kilometers per second motion of the Earth through the ether. So to overcome this problem, Einstein simply abolished the ether in his relativity theory. The very significant result of the Sanyak experiment was that it proved that the ether existed. Let us see how it did this. It is a fundamental feature of relativity that it claims that as there is no ether, light travels away from a source at the same speed relative to the source, whether the source is moving or not. Thus, whether the table is turning or not, the fringe patterns should stay the same. But if the ether exists, once the light has left the source, the speed of the light is controlled by the ether, independent of the speed of the table, mirrors, etc., as we see here. So let us see what happens when we rotate the table. Here, the light is split, and the red and blue lights go in opposite directions. But notice that the left-hand mirror has moved around in such a direction that the distance the red light has to travel is further. Now in relativity, the same time should be taken because the splitter is also moving and the distance between them is the same. But, now imagine that the ether exists and the speed of the light is controlled by the stationary ether. Imagine the ether like a thick treacle that limits how fast the light can travel independent of the motion of the light source, the splitter or the mirrors. The result is that the red light takes longer to reach the left hand mirror. Similarly, the right hand mirror is coming towards the blue light, so it reaches the mirror quicker. After they change ends, the red light again takes longer to reach the recombiner whilst the blue light gets there quicker again. So they reach the photographic plate with a delay between them and this changes the fringe pattern. 
In fact, Sanyak, using the speed of the rotation of the table, calculated how much the fringes should change, and found that they did change by just that amount. The crucial feature of this experiment is that it demonstrates that the ether does exist, which demolishes relativity. How does the scientific establishment deal with this result? By muddying the waters with scientific gobbledygook. Wikipedia says, In the above discussion, the rotation mentioned is a rotation with respect to an inertial reference frame. Since this experiment does not involve a relativistic velocity, the same wording is valid both in the context of classical electrodynamics and special relativity. How on earth can it be valid in both theories? It clearly proves that the ether exists because the speed of the light is controlled by the ether independent of the rotating table and mirrors. This Sanyak effect is used by airlines for their compass directions. As the plane turns, the change in the fringes are translated into a change in the direction of the plane that then registers on the cockpit compass. In addition, I have received comments from two scientists complaining that they were never taught about the Sanyak experiment. The first said, after 35 years as a another correspondent complained that his professors never mentioned these important experiments. Dear Mr. Bowden, thank you for your enjoyable and well-written website. I've enjoyed visiting there today. I was especially interested in your comments on geocentricity, which, as noted, are controversial. The amazing thing is that none of the experiments cited were ever discussed in my undergraduate education, nor the implications cited. All my life I have heard the story of how Copernicus's theory came to prevail. I would have thought that major experimental evidence, already in existence, and calling the theory into question, would have at least been cited, proved that the ether existed. The Michelson-Morley experiment failed to detect the 30 kilometers per second motion of the Earth through the ether. So as to overcome this problem, Einstein simply abolished the ether. The Earth is not moving, and we can prove this day in and day out. This is how you can show anyone, you can guarantee them, you can prove that we do not orbit the sun. There is no way around this matter is what part is facing the sun and every 24 hours what happens the exact same spot on the earth faces the sun uh, the red dot on the edge here that represents sunrise around 6 a.m. around noon okay or at noon would be the white square here and around 6 p.m. would be sunset again these are going to vary a little bit as far as where the shadow is depending, you know, what time of year it is, but the Earth is it's still going to turn 360 degrees in one day. It doesn't matter where the shadow is. Please don't get hung up on something that matters not. The exact same spot on the Earth, every 24 hours, exactly, faces the Sun, because the Earth rotates 360 degrees on its axis, tilted or not. It turns 360 degrees once every 24.00 hours, okay? Okay, the very first day we're going to start, here we go, all right? It's 12 noon. Here's our guide up here. 12 noon. Why? Because this edge of the earth right here, this red part, is facing directly at the sun. So what we're going to do is we are going to progress around. We know every 24 hours there's a 360 degree um, turn on the earth okay exactly all right so day one day two three four five six seven eight nine. let's keep going we go all the way around the exact halfway point 183 days later the problem is it is now midnight 